From the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Well, today we're going to have stories about the conjure chest and other supernatural tales of the Old South. The conjure chest, an elegant mahogany veneer chest of drawers hand carved by an African-American slave 150 years ago, resides in the Kentucky History Museum at Frankfurt. Crafted in the Old World Empire style, the chest has glass knobs on its four drawers. Nothing about its outward appearance gives any hint that tragedy and tears has stalked this existence. To historians, it's simply known as the Conjured Chest. Twenty years or so before the Civil War, there was a family... The head of that family, his name was Jacob Cooley, and he lived a sumptuous life as a wealthy southern planter. He owned many slaves and farmed thousands of acres, but he was also an evil, despicable man who frequently beat his slaves for the slightest infraction of his oh-so-stringent rules. Now, Jacob Cooley ordered that one of his slaves an excellent furniture maker named Hosea to construct a chest that would be used for his firstborn child. For some unknown reason, Jacob was angered at Hosea's finished product and beat him so savagely that he died a few days later. Now, Mr. Cooley's slaves were led by an old conjure man that lived amongst all the other slaves there on that farm. And they placed a curse on the chest for all future generations. They were not about to let Hosea's murder go unavenged. One drawer was sprinkled with dried owl's blood and a conjure chant was sung. All those associated with the chest would fall within the curse's evil power. Somehow or other, Jacob Cooley himself evidently escaped the malevolence. However, his descendants were not as fortunate. The baby for whom the chest was built died soon after birth. The chest was in his nursery. His brother inherited the chest and he was stabbed to death by his personal servant. Jacob Cooley had another son, John, who inherited one of his father's many plantations. The young man led a serene bachelor's life until a beautiful young woman, barely out of her teens, came into his life. Her name was Ellie and she soon married John, who was almost 30 years older than her. The couple inherited the conjured chest. Knowing of the tragedies that had befallen her husband's siblings, she put the chest in an attic. Meanwhile, Jacob Cooley's youngest daughter, Melinda, eloped with an Irish man named Sean that he did not approve of. With nowhere to live, Melinda turned to Ellie, John and Ellie had done well and had accumulated several farms in Tennessee. They turned over one of these to Sean and Melinda to work. While Melinda bore her young husband a brood of children and worked from sunrise to sunset, Sean came to loathe the dullness of farm life. He was no gentleman farmer. Ellie Cooley tried to help but Sean's rebuffs made her presence unwelcome. To try to bring some beauty into Melinda's dreary existence, Ellie sent over her father-in-law's chest. 
It had been in her attic for a very long time and nothing had happened. She had almost forgotten the chest's legacy. Perhaps the curse was only a lot of talk. Shortly after his wife's death, Sean was struck in the head by a steamboat's gangplank and died. But then, believe it or not, he had already deserted poor Melinda. He had left off to go to New Orleans where eventually he had met his death. She, however, could not overcome this abandonment. She took to her bed and she soon died after. An exhausted, gray-haired woman barely out of her thirties. Now the conjure chest had claimed its third and fourth victims. The couple left many orphan children. John Cooley was given the job of traveling to Tennessee to assign the youngsters, all of whom were his nephews and nieces, to other family members. The youngest, a baby named Evelyn, ran up to him, her tiny arms outstretched. John took her to live with his own family in Kentucky. Little Evelyn grew into a beautiful and intelligent young woman. When she turned 16, Evelyn passed an examination that provided her with a teaching certificate with which she took over a one-room schoolhouse. She met and married a Scotsman by the name of Malcolm Johnson barely two months after she had begun to teach. As a wedding present, Ellie and her family presented her niece with Jacob Cooley's handsome chest and the evil passed to a new generation. Evelyn Johnson, as she was then known after her marriage, had children and even adopted a young orphan, a girl named Arabella. The curse was all but forgotten. Evelyn had the chest but didn't find it necessary to use right away. However, after Arabella married some years later, Evelyn put the girl's brighter bridal gown in the chest. Shortly thereafter, Arabella's husband suddenly died. That was the beginning of a series of horrible events visited upon Evelyn and Ellie. Arabella's child died after her baby clothes had been put in the chest. Evelyn's daughter-in-law, Esther, married to her oldest son, put her wedding attire in the chest. She too died. Evelyn's Aunt Sarah knitted a scarf and gloves to give her son for Christmas. While walking along a train trestle, he fell off and was killed a few days before Christmas. Two other tragedies befell Evelyn's immediate family. A son-in-law deserted his wife and a child was crippled for life in a bizarre accident. Yet Evelyn's husband, Malcolm, was a success. A small man, always courteous to those around him, he parlayed a shrewd Scottish sense of thrift into a burgeoning business empire that at its height consisted of mills, houses, a coal yard, wharf, and dry goods store. Malcolm was an extraordinarily wealthy man when he died. Despite her material comfort, his wife was haunted by the memories of those around her who were struck down or stricken in some other way by hardship. She committed suicide. Eleven persons the conjure chest had put its curse upon. It was taking its toll. As the 20th century unfolded, the chest was inherited by Virginia Carey Hudson from her grandmother, Evelyn Johnson. Mrs. Hudson's thought tales of the curse were hearsay. She was wrong. Her first baby clothes were put in the chest she died. Another child's clothes were tucked in a drawer and she contracted infantile paralysis. Another daughter's wedding dress was stored there and her first husband ran off. A son was stabbed in the hand. He had clothes in the chest. A friend of the family put hunting clothes in it. He was shot in a hunting accident. And so it went. Sixteen victims, all of whom had one thing in common some other personal clothing had been put in the conjure chest. Mrs. Hudson wanted to put an end to the curse. She found what she hoped would be the solution in the form of an old friend of hers, an African-American woman named Annie. Annie understood curses and conjures. The spell cast by Hosea's faithful companions would be broken only when three conditions were met. First, 
Mrs. Hudson would have to be given a dead owl without her having to ask for one. Second, the green leaves of a willow tree had to be boiled from sunup to sundown. The dead owl had to remain in sight. Third, the boiled liquid was then to be buried in a jug with its handle facing east towards the rising sun below a flowering bush. A stuffed owl given to Mrs. Hudson's son by a friend accomplished the first requirement. Mrs. Hudson plucked leaves from a nearby willow tree and boiled them in a large black pot. The owl kept watch from a kitchen counter. At dusk, old Annie and Mrs. Hudson took the jug and with its handle pointed east, buried it beneath a flowering lilac bush outside the kitchen window. Annie said they would only know if the curse had been broken if one of them died before the first full days of fall. Annie died in early September, the 17th and last known victim of the conjure chest. The final private owners of the conjure chest was Mrs. Hudson's daughter, Virginia Maine. Though she may have been skeptical of the curse, she knew fully well the story of its lifting by Annie and her mother, and she never, ever stored anything in the chest and kept it hidden in the attic. The Kentucky History Museum has it now. Mrs. Maine donated to the museum in 1976. According to museum registers, Mike Hudson, the chest is in storage in our vaults, awaiting the time when it fits into a new exhibit. Supposedly the curse has been removed, but has it? Tucked safely in the top chest drawer is an envelope with a cluster of owl feathers inside. Of course, the museum isn't taking any chances whatsoever. The Witch Leah There's these old woods near Battletown, Kentucky, and the locals will tell you it is a very, very dangerous place to visit. As a matter of fact, they tell you, if you're going to go in there, you better take a very knowledgeable guide. And you only go there in the fall or the winter, when all the deadly rattlesnakes are in hibernation. But there might be another reason to be cautious in that old forest. It might be because of the ghost of Leah. An accused witch who died mysteriously 150 years ago, she is said to haunt the old cemetery in the Lapland woods where her mortal remains are buried. Some claim that Witch Leah is the oldest haunting in all of Kentucky. Now a hunter a few years back, he told another resident that he believed he had seen Leah's ghost hovering near her grave in her old cemetery where her remains were laid to rest. He described the apparition as having long black hair and swathed in a white robe with a black tie at her waist and throat and a purple light seemed to envelop the incomplete form. Now when you look back at the life of Leah it's hard to separate the legend that's grown up around her as to the actual facts just because there's so few of them. It's known she was born around 1818, the daughter of a powerful Kentucky witch. It ran in her family. As a child, she preferred to be alone, strolling for hours upon and in the woods, searching for fruit and berries to eat. She had very few friends, and she hardly visited any of her neighbors or played with her children. Once she was playing at a neighbor's, and their black cat began to scratch wildly at the walls. When the front door was open, it ran screeching from the house, never to be seen again. Leah also had the power to foretell the future. She was called in those days a seer. She often predicted the death of critically ill people. And as she was frequently right, her reputation for knowing the future spread through the frontier community. It's not really truly known how many times she was wrong. She died on August 21st, 1840, and her death is also shrouded in uncertainty. 
Some say she starved to death in the woods. Other reports say that she was burned to death when her house caught on fire. She was only 22 years old and she lives on in a ghostly legend that even now to this day continues amongst the older residents of Meade County. Now several years ago, a resident of that area took a newspaper reporter and two other companions to Leah's grave. They battled through dense underbrush, already armed just in case they came across some rattlesnakes. And they found that old hilltop cemetery deep inside a grove of trees. Nobody had been there for decades. There was only some plots that could be seen, maybe as many as 70, most of them covered with pine needles, leaves, and moss. Leah's grave was the only one with a pointed headstone. Nothing stirred there, and it was still daylight. The visitors did find one peculiar detail during their visit. Shortly after Leah died, locals who claimed to have seen her ghost piled a two feet high stack of small boulders on her grave to keep her in her coffin they hoped just in case for over a century that pile of stones had remained intact on this day however the rocks were in disarray about half of them had been removed but by whom and for what purpose I'm sure the witch Leah surely knows the answer the murderer bloody Polly there was a beautiful woman named Frances Brown she was tall and slender and at age 18 she was known as having one of the sweetest dispositions and a very gentle face she had beautiful blonde hair creamy complexion and large brown eyes she lived with her father, Frederick Brown. Her, bro her mother, brothers and sisters, all of them lived in a log cabin a few miles from Lancaster. Mr. Brown had brought his family to the rough Kentucky wilderness from Maryland in the year 1815. He soon turned their frontier cabin and a few acres into a large thriving plantation. His mules broke the earth for crops and a bill built with his own hands separated hemp from flax for spinning. Life was good for the Brown family, that is, until the day that Harry Geis showed up. Now Frances had a sister. Her name was Polly. She was two years older. She had black hair, flashing eyes, and a fiery temper, and she usually got her way. One of Polly's worst fears was becoming an old maid. At that time, women usually married by their late teens. And by then, her prospects were becoming very dim. In other words, Polly was getting desperate to find a husband. And along comes Harry Geis, single and evidently on his way to becoming a prosperous merchant. And Polly wanted to make him her husband. They became engaged, but it wasn't long before the tensions toward, turned towards her younger sister, the beautiful Frances. Perhaps it was Polly's bad temper which made the young bachelor have second thoughts. However, it was soon evident to everyone in the neighborhood that Harry would soon be marrying Frances or Fanny as she was known and not Polly. It was apparent to everyone except Polly, of course. She was enraged at the thought of losing Harry Geist to her sister. Her devious mind created a scheme so horrible that years passed before its full impact was known. Then a faithful series of events started one morning when Harry Geist set out to Maysville. There was no transportation in those days, especially out of the deep wilderness that surrounded the area where the Browns lived. So goods were transported from Philadelphia to Maysville, where they were offloaded and toted to the outlying pioneer communities. Geis periodically made the several, several hundred mile round trip, taking several days to complete the journey. 
On this day, however, as he bade farewell to Francis, he had no way of knowing that it would be the last time the two would ever be together. A few hours after he departed, Polly found her sister weaving. Polly cheerfully persuaded her sister to accompany her to a Mrs. Brassfield's, there to examine a new quilt pattern the woman was completing. The two young women plunged through the thick forest. In a grove of pawpaw trees, Polly remarked that Frances's hair was coming loose. She would help her pin it up, guiding her sister to a log where she could sit. Frances should never have turned her back on her sister. As soon as she did, Polly drew a hatchet from beneath her skirt and grasping her sister's hair firmly in her left hand, brought the blade down in a mighty swing at her sister's pale neck. Blood spewed from severed arteries. Chop, chop, chop. Blow after blow rained down on helpless Frances. Her sister crazily swinging the bloody hatchet in a murderous rage. Frances cried out for mercy, but her screams were quickly silenced. Polly didn't stop until her sister's mangled head rolled off her lifeless torso. The murder had been carefully planned, savagely executed. Polly Brown had picked a particular part of the forest in which to carry out her deed. She dragged her sister's remain to a nearby sinkhole and buried them in the soft earth, being careful to obliterate any sign of a struggle or blood. So meticulous had been her scheme that she had secreted a change of clothing nearby so as not to call attention to her own bloodstained garments. In a field some distance away, three young slaves, Abe, Tom, and Pomp, heard Frances's screams. Polly, don't kill me, she cried. Abe, the oldest, dashed forward and hid behind a bush. He saw Polly inflict the final mortar wounds. Quickly fleeing, he told his companions what he had seen. He made them swear never to reveal what had occurred. All three were fearful they would be blamed for the murder. For the rest of the day, Polly quietly gathered up her sister's saddle, good clothing, and personally frecks from their home and stashed them in another area of the forest, several hundred yards away from her sister's dismal grave. She calmly returned home and awaited the discovery of Francis's absence. The murderers had an explanation prepared. As twilight descended, Francis's parents did indeed wonder where their daughter was. Polly slyly stepped forward and offered her opinion that she must have run away with Harry as he had left for Maysville that morning. She pointed to the fact that Francis's saddle and Sunday clothes were missing, sure signs that guys had persuaded her to leave with him. The hint of a self-satisfied smile must have slipped across Polly's face. She knew that it would be days or weeks before Geist returned with his merchandise. By that time she hoped her rival would have been forgotten and Harry would turn his attention to her. Polly's plans would have succeeded but for a macabre discovery by several small boys a few weeks later. Sent to gather pawpaws in the woods, Claiborne Lear, Joshua Comley, and Sammy Johnson were startled by a wild pig chewing at something on the ground. When they got closer, they were scared witless to see that the pig's snout was actually chomping down on a thin white hand sticking out of the soil. The boys, horrified, raced home to tell their parents of their awful discovery, and within hours, Several neighbors had gathered at the pawpaw patch. They unearthed the remains of a headless Frances. Her parents reburied her on the plantation grounds. The whereabouts of Frances's good clothing and saddle puzzled the Brown family. A psychic, a man named Ramsey, who lived in nearby Lancaster, predicted that the missing items would be found precisely 440 yards south of their home. Finally, a friend by the name of Thompson Arnold measured out the distance and found the material only a few inches below ground. The devious plan hatched by Polly Brown succeeded in keeping anyone from suspecting her, but failed at winning Harry Geis's affection. 
heartbroken, he eventually left town. The owners of the slave grew suspicious. They recalled that the youths had been working near where Polly's body was found. Eventually, Tom and Pomp were arrested and jailed. Perhaps someone overheard one of them talking about the murder. Or maybe they were confused by Abe's orders to keep quiet. Whatever the reason, they were tried for murder. The only evidence presented by their jailer was that he had claimed to have heard one of them say the first lick didn't kill her. Justice was non existent for African American slaves, and any pretense of a fair trial was a mockery. The boys were found guilty on December 13, 1820. Tom was hanged on January 7, 1821. Pomp was sent to the gallows two weeks later, and nothing is known of Abe's fate. Polly didn't raise a hand to prevent the tragic hanging of two innocent young men. She now had the blood of three people staining her hands. It was all too much even for Polly's twisted mind. Her family moved away to Indianapolis, leaving only her behind. It isn't known why. Perhaps it was her turning towards herbs as cures for disease, or her long walks in the woods, particularly near the old pawpaw tree where her sister's body lay for so long. Or maybe they had their own suspicions that she was the culprit of their other daughter's death. Polly moved into a small cabin when the Brown Farm was purchased by Josiah Burnside. Mr. and Mrs. Logan Harris lived there and more or less looked after her. One night, many years later, Polly Brown was returning through the woods with a visit after visiting a sick patient. Her herbal medicines were popular on the frontier where physician might be hundreds of miles away. On this evening, however, even the strongest drugs would not have helped her. Coming at her was the ghost of her sister Frances, her arms outstretched as if to grab at her tormentor. The apparition's neck was a bloody stump. Polly ran and ran, screaming, shaking uncontrollably at the sight of her reanimated sister. When she stumbled into the Harris cabin, babbling about Frances's ghost, the couple immediately put her to bed. From that night forward, Polly Brown descended into a mania from which she never recovered. Eventually, she was chained to her bed after she was caught attempting to break into her old home. Her gray hair fell in long, unkept strands about her shoulders, her once dancing eyes dull and sunken. Mr. and Mrs. Harris could only keep her in a rough-hewn sack dress. The truth was eventually learned. As she lay dying, Polly confessed to the murder of her sister and expressed her sorrow for the wrongful death of Pomp and Tom. She amazed Mr. and Mrs. Harris by appearing completely lucid on her deathbed. Josiah Bernstein and his wife, Almira, raised a large family on the Old Brown Plantation. Regular appearances by the ghost of Frances became part of the family's tradition. She would playfully pull covers from the bed or rush through the front door, slamming it as she entered. The soft rustle of her skirts were heard ascending the stairs to her old loom room. The last remnants of the Brown homestead burnt down to the ground about 1940. But what happened to the ghost of Frances? Did it vanish also with the last of her old home? Most of the folks in the neighborhood think so, but others, well, other people who know the tragic trail aren't so sure. They think that Frances is still out there somewhere looking for her head. Or who knows, maybe it's not Frances's ghost who's there but the murderous Polly's. The Ghost Lovers There was a man known as Old Noel Simpson, and he wasn't really known for spreading wild tales. He was a fisherman, and sometimes he made up these claims about what he got, or the one that got away. But that's all he was known about fibbing for. And when one day he told a story at the general store about something that was so improbable 
that they could not believe it. They were thinking, had he taken to drink? Or worse, maybe whiskey? That's why the story he told left them wide-eyed and disbelieving all those that gathered around him to listen to his story. He said that he had left the little store a few miles from Bowling Green and that he didn't want to share his story with all those hecklers and that he was going to come back with some eyewitnesses and so he did about a week later. He came back this time with somebody by the name of Hosiah. Now both men claimed to have seen a boy and a girl ghost lovers floating down the barren river in a small boat and they tried to get up a company to prove their statement. There was a Mr. Lindley, an old schoolmaster who was finally persuaded to accompany them back to the river. The three of them boarded a rowboat at sunset and floated off downstream. They slipped past cedar trees clinging to the steep banks while bats swooped low to pick off tasty dragonflies dancing on the water's surface. The stream narrowed so that strands of quivering sycamores formed a canopy over the water. At last they came to an area known as Hamel's Cliff. While Hathaway arose and Simpson kept a sharp look out ahead, the schoolmaster peered back upstream. He suddenly gave a sharp cry and collapsed in the bottom of the boat. Bearing down on them in the dusky twilight was a translucent skiff being rowed by a wan, black-haired young man. Admiring his muscular physique was a blonde young woman, her skin as white as milk, with her back resting against the bow of the boat, her arms draped atop the gunwales. She was smiling at her bow's efforts, at his rhythm with the oars. The opposite shore was clearly visible through them. Neither the girl nor the boy took any notice of the three men watching their ghostly progress. The phantom rowboat made no sound as it swept by. As quickly as the little boat had appeared, it abruptly stopped. The girl stood up and put her arms around the young man. The boat quickly vanished beneath the surface. Nary a ripple stirred the calm waters. Days later, Lindley began asking around if anyone might know who the ghostly boaters might have been. The widow Overton nodded her head knowingly when she heard the question. Yes, she told the schoolmaster. They must have been Harry Stonewall and Annette Belmont. The couple had eloped and had been seen setting off in Annette's boat to the Barren River. They were last seen near Hamel's Cliff in the spring of 1825. Obviously something had happened to those two lovers where they never reached their destination. Shadow of the Unknown The Cumberland Lake region of South Kentucky is a rich and its tales of the supernatural. Perhaps it's the mountainous terrain, its isolated settlements that give rise to so many beliefs of hauntings and ghosts. Eddie had an eerie experience several years ago that he told another writer by the name of Helen. Eddie and his wife had just finished supper when their telephone rang and a man's deep voice advised him that if he would meet him at a certain house not too far from where he was at that Eddie was going to find one of the best ghost stories ever. He jumped in his car and headed for the abandoned farmhouse one that he had passed many times before. The man met Eddie at the front door and guided him inside and to his amazement Eddie found oil lamps lighting the rooms all furnished in the turn of the century style. Suddenly, the soft rustle of skirts and a slight cry caused him to glance at the staircase. Coming down was a lovely girl in a long dress with petticoats. Eddie's nameless host explained that the girl had lived in the house with her widowed mother. When she remarried, her husband began beating her daughter in frequent Duncan rages. Then one day he killed her with a sharp blow to the head. The girl's mother accepted her husband's explanation that the girl had fallen from a horse, or at least she didn't ask questions 
of her brutal spouse. But the girl's soul never rested in peace, the man told Eddie. He watched as the man and young woman walked out the front door. Eddie rushed to follow, but they vanished. Eddie knocked on the door of the lighted farmhouse across the street to ask if he might use the telephone. He called his wife to bring his camera. Minutes later, as a couple walked towards the house, they noticed that all the lights had been turned out. The front door, which Eddie had left open, was now firmly closed. He put his shoulder to it and after several tries finally forced it open. The rooms were empty. Dust covered the floor and windows. Massive cobwebs hung from the ceiling. There was no sign of the furniture and lighted lamps. Eddie had only seen a different scene so many minutes before, where everything was new and the lights blazed. The farmer at whose house Eddie had telephoned his wife from said he had only seen him, Eddie, go into the house. He had not seen any lights through the window. Eddie never solved the mystery of what happened to him that night. To him, it always remained the time he walked into the shadow of the unknown. The devil lived in New Orleans, and this is his address. There's an ornate mansion at 1319 St. Charles Avenue that should be avoided at all costs. Why, you may ask? Because the devil once took up residence at that location in New Orleans. The house was built sometimes in the 1820s, the so-called Devil's Mansion, who according to legend became constructed literally overnight. Satan needed this house for his beautiful young mistress, a Madeleine Freneau. So quickly did the house go up, however, that each room was at a different level. Steps led up or down to every room. Even so, the mansion was outfitted with the best Satan's money could buy. Crystal chandeliers hung above carved mahogany furniture, while the finest dinner china and silverware were set for visitors who never came. Strangely, no servants were ever employed there. Not even dust dared to gather in the devil's own kingdom. Mademoiselle, quickly tired of being left alone to wander the lifeless rooms while the devil plied his trade on the wicked streets. Sometimes he would be gone for several days at a time. In time she found another lover. His name was Alcide Cancien, a vain and handsome Creole man who found in Madeline such a physical pleasure that he had never known. Again and again he came to St. Charles Avenue to lose himself in Madeline's arms. Alcide was unaware that he had a rival who would stop at nothing to destroy the illicit liaison. One day Alcide was particularly morose. As was the couple's habit when the devil was away, they were eating dinner in the elegant dining room. Madeline asked him the cause of his melancholy. He told of his experience a few hours earlier. On the sidewalk outside the mansion, he had been accosted by a dark-haired man attired in a great cape and top hat. The stranger asked him if he knew Madeleine Fernot. Alcide said truthfully that she was his lover. He was on his way to see her at that very moment. The stranger laughed merrily and said that he too was her lover, but that he had grown tired of her. Alcide could have her but only under one condition. The couple could leave with a million pounds of gold, the stranger promised, if Alcide promised to change their names to Monsieur and Madame L. Alcide told Madeline that he was puzzled as to what the L said stood for. She evaded answering for a few moments, but at last acknowledged that the L symbolized Lucifer. To leave St. Charles Avenue, they would have to become the devil's couple. Despite the conditions, Madeline begged to leave with Alcide. She had had enough of the devil's insatiable depravity. Alcide just laughed at her. He had no intention of taking Madeline anywhere. The devil was right. He too was growing tired of her. And she was growing old, he added. There were many other younger and more beautiful women he could have. 
Besides, a mistress would never make a proper wife. Mademoiselle Frenot was furious. She grabbed a long cloth napkin, and before Alcide could act, she had twisted it about his throat, crushing an artery. Blood spewed from the dying man's mouth, soaking Madeline's hands and gown. Alcide slid off the chair and fell in a heap on the lush carpet, a pool of blood forming beside his head. For the rest of the night, Madeline tried to wash the blood from her body and clothing. It would not go away. At last, the devil returned from his rounds. Madeline told him of the events, but he simply chuckled in merriment. His plans were progressing nicely, he thought. He hoisted Alcide's corpse over his shoulder, grabbed the struggling Madeline by the arm, and climbed to the roof. Grinning, he told Madeline that he had not had a decent meal all day. With that, he began to devour Alcide's body, leaving only a few bloody shreds of skin. He threw those to the alley below for the hungry neighborhood cats. His hunger still not satiated, he turned to Madeline. For many years, the three-story house stood vacant, its bottom windows barred, moss growing on the pillars. A family finally moved in during the 1840s, but with them came the ghost of Madeline and Alcide. It was always the same. In the dining room, a large table would materialize. Seated at it were the diaphanous figures of the young couple. Soon there was a scream and Madeline's ghost lunged for the deceitful Alcide. As she twisted the napkin around his throat, the entire scene faded away. That family, and many others after it, found the horrible scenario too upsetting to stay for long. The only family to stay was the Charles family. The couple, husband and wife, stayed there. And this just started after the Civil War. She herself, Mrs. Charles, was the daughter of a Civil War general. They saw the ghostly murder take place many times, but grew to accept the uninvited ones, as they called Madeline and Alcide. They loved the house and remained for many years. Sadly, the Charles' infant daughter died there. Mrs. Charles passed away soon after that. Her husband remained a virtual recluse, keeping meticulous diaries of his experiences there. It was he who was responsible for gathering the house's incredible early history. A Mrs. Jacks and her family later lived in the Devil's Mansion, but the haunting overwhelmed them. Not only did the spectacle in the dining room frequently turn up, but often there was the acrid smell of smoke when no fire was set in one of the numerous Italian carved fireplaces. Doorknobs would be twisted by unseen hands, and disembodied footsteps raced up and down the hallways. To passerbys familiar with the house, the weirdest sight of all was the head of the devil himself, embedded in the gable. Some said it was simply a hideous gargoyle made of stone or bronze, but those who really knew said it was the head of the living devil himself. And how did they know? If you watched carefully, the eyes would follow your path and upon its lips one could see that they would pull back in a snarl revealing long spiked teeth soaked in human blood. Inevitably the house was demolished many many decades ago.